What is it to work at the Apple? Apple attracts some amazing people. The people at Apple are very committed to the company as a whole. Mm. And to me, as a new employee, that was a big motivator. An author of Breaking the Code. You have worked with the likes of, of course, Great, great, great Steve Jobs and Tim Cook. Steve Jobs was a master at influence. What Steve Jobs was a master at is getting people to see the world the way he saw the world. Up until that point, everything looked like a Blackberry with a keyboard and maybe with a yeah. stylus. And Steve Jobs broke the code. I have shifted my perspective around what does it mean to actually be kind and respectful to this other person. In my mind, being nice to someone was in conflict with giving them direct feedback when they were not yeah. doing something. So it was not easy for me to say, that's not good enough, or I'm not happy with that result. You've got the Elon Musk example, or maybe the Steve Jobs example, where they're mm -hmm. abrasive and difficult. And the question is finding that middle place. Uh, thank you so much, Rusty, for joining us on this podcast, The X Monks Drive. Such a pleasure having you here. Thank you, Gaurav. It's, uh, I'm excited to be here and looking forward to our conversation. Yeah. And what a beautiful uh, start to this conversation. Just before this conversation, we were talking about the impermanence of life. That if life is not about building genuine connections, if it's not about having and creating worth remembering experiences for each other what else life is all about so thank you for adding this chapter to my life absolutely and i just to, to build on that i think one of the reflecting back on my own life and i think this is true for many people some of the most formative moments have been the most difficult moments mm. and being willing to be put yourself into those moments as they're happening 100% and say you know it may be uncomfortable you may not like it you may want it to end and yet it is one of those experiences of life that shapes you and to remember that in the moment can be a helpful perspective shift yeah and i'm not surprised it's coming from you having worked with apple steve jobs said that you know while we, you'll be walking on this path called life you might not be able to connect the dots and one day when you look back you'll be able to connect the dots. So I'm not surprised it's coming from you, Rusty. <laughs> well, I was just going to say it's, you know, I, I worked at Apple for 14 years. And uh, <laughs> when I started, Steve Jobs was there. I joined in 2005 and partway through my tenure, he passed away. Yeah. And I continued on through 2019 at Apple. And what a, what a privilege to have worked at a company with a leader like Steve Jobs. Yeah, I'm sure. That's exactly what I was about to mention, that what a privileged life you have lived. You started your career with GE. And during that time, Jack Welch was leading GE. And uh, you have worked with the likes of, of course, great, great, great Steve Jobs and uh, Tim Cook. What a privileged life. I just envy that. It is a very privileged life. I've always sought out companies like that. I was uh, very excited to go work at General Electric when I graduated mm -hmm. from college back in those days. Jack Welch was seen as the management guru. Everybody looked yeah. up to Jack Welch as this uh, expert yeah. in management and leadership. And it was wonderful to work there. Uh, and similar with Steve Jobs, although I, I will say that his um, the respect that he has garnered has grown even after mm -hmm. he has died. I think he had that as he was alive, but as he has yeah. passed away, I think it's grown even more. Yeah. You know, my, my first encounter with Jack Welch and... His philosophy started with uh, reading this book called Straight from the Gut. And that's how I got to know him. I got to know about him. What do you think? What are those lessons that you learned from your GE days that continue to serve you today as well? One of the things that Jack Welsh was known for, and I think the title of his book, Straight from the Gut, speaks to this. Yeah, is being very direct with people about what's working and what's not working. And I will tell you that early in my career, especially, but I think in, in many parts of my career, that was a challenge for me. How mm. direct can I really be with someone when they're not meeting expectations? Mm. Uh, but just being in that environment and hearing time and again from leaders, specific feedback, but also hearing their stories about times when they were direct and times when they weren't direct. 
And the universal theme that I heard from people, especially when it came to managing others, was I didn't move quickly enough. I knew what the situation mm -hmm. was and I knew what I needed to do, but I didn't do it. And that's normal because as we were saying earlier at the start of this conversation, we all value other people and connection and relationship and so on. And so even mm -hmm. if someone's not doing a good job, you still have a connection with them. Mm -hmm. And so it's finding a way to navigate that situation where you may have a personal connection and there's a job expectation that is not mm -hmm. being met. How do you have that conversation in a way that is respectful of the other person, treats mm -hmm. them well, and is very clear about what the expectation is and where they may not be meeting it? Yeah, yeah. You know, Rusty, you mentioned that it was difficult for you to be direct with people when you started your career. What was the difficulty? What was coming in your way? And uh, what was stopping you to be direct with people? I grew up in the kind of family where there was a big emphasis on being polite and treating mm. other people well, being respectful, yeah. and so on. And so I, I interpreted that as a child as being nice. So I had to be nice to other people. And in my mind, being nice to someone was in conflict with giving them direct feedback when they were not yeah. doing something. Hmm. So it was not easy for me to say, that's not good enough, or I'm not happy with that result, uh, and find a way to do it that wasn't just angry and creating conflict. And so it was this, uh, for me, it was really a journey and a process of learning, how can I disagree with someone? How can I express dissatisfaction? Hmm. How can I tell them they're not doing a good job? But doing it in a way that's not angry or mean or uh, creating conflict, but mm. inviting them into a conversation that says, this is where I, how I'm seeing the situation. Yeah. It, we need to change something. Let's have a conversation about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for creating this beautiful distinction when you're saying that there was a need to be nice to people and so that I can have the image of being nice. And you picked it up from your childhood. I think that's where most of us pick it up, right? That we should be polite to people. Uh, we should not be rude to people. We should not be direct and confrontational to people. But we don't realize it, that as we continue to wear this armor of being nice, we forget that being truthful to your own self is as important as being nice. You know, during one of my conversations, Rusty, one of the um, guests created this distinction for me that being nice is very different from being kind. And for me, that was an aha moment. So what was your journey? What is the transition that a person can make from experiencing this difficulty of sharing the feedback as is to being comfortable at a place where I'm very comfortable sharing what I feel is the need of the hour? Mm -hmm. So what transitions did you go through? And what transitions can people expect? Leaders expect that what is that they can do that could help them to have that transition. Yeah, well, I think that distinction between being nice and kind is a really important one. And being true to yourself, because you can be kind to other people. And in fact, in most cases, I believe honesty is the kindest thing that you can give to somebody else. So for me, this transition of learning how to be direct and give people more specific feedback is was really one of changing my perception, uh, changing my perspective really about this distinction between nice and kind. Because as long as I believed it was not nice to tell someone if they're not meeting expectations, mm -hmm. as long as that was in conflict with me, that created a desire to delay, to avoid the conversation, to try to say it in an indirect way rather than a very clear and specific way. Mm -hmm. So I had all of these kind of coping behaviors trying to be both nice and clear, and it was, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't do it. Uh, and so I, you know, in that way, I was ineffective. And so for me, shifting my perspective around what does it mean to, like, how can I still be a good person? And how can I be kind and respectful of the other person? And in fact, telling them specifically what they're doing well and what they're not doing well is a real gift. I will share a story early in my career when I started at General Electric, I started as an engineer and I joined an engineering team. And I remember my very first performance review where my boss sat down and said, you're doing a great job. I think you're doing this really well and this really well. And he said, mm -hmm. you know, congratulations. I said, that's great. What can I do better? And he said, yeah, I don't really have any suggestions for what you can do better. And that was so dissatisfying for me because mm -hmm. I wanted to know where the areas that I'm not doing well. And if you put yourself in the other position of the person who's giving feedback, 
and you don't have something to help the other person continue to improve, to reach their goals, to give them some tips, some guidance, some suggestions on how they can improve, you're really doing them a disservice. Mm, and so I've, mm, as mm. I have shifted my perspective around what does it mean to actually be kind and respectful to this other person, mm. it's supporting them in achieving their goals, mm. understanding what's important to them, giving them feedback. Everybody wants to be happy. Everybody wants to do well in their work. And if you mm. know something about the other person that you're not sharing with them that could help them to be happier and more successful, then it's really a disservice not to share it with them. Yeah, yeah. You know, as one of my mentors talk about, that's very important to uh, to walk with somebody where people can identify their own superpowers and your association with that person should assist the person to reach out to their goals, that they should be able to reach out to their goals. And as I was just listening to you being honest, nice and kind, it just came to me that when I'm being nice, I'm being nice for myself. And when I'm being kind, I'm kind to the other person. Now, interestingly, as much as I'm trying to be nice, still the central point around which the world is revolving for me is myself. And when I'm being kind, my world is revolving around the other person. Such a great point, because being nice is about how other people see you. Yeah, I want to be nice because I want to be seen as nice. Exactly. And that's all about me. Yeah, yeah great point. Yeah. Great. You know, and Steve Jobs said that in case you would like to be nice to people and you would want people to be happy that you should be, uh, you should be selling ice cream. Don't be in the business. Yeah, well, and I think that this is one of the conflicts that people see, mm. right? You know, we all know the stories of Steve Jobs. And when yeah. I joined Apple uh, way back in 2005, one of the stories I heard was about people who got in an elevator and Steve Jobs stepped into the elevator and they rode up and, you know, Steve Jobs would ask them, what do you do here? And if they didn't have a good answer, the rumors were he would go and have the person fired. Mm. I have no idea if this is true or not true. And it, it mm. really doesn't matter, but it's part of this reputation of Steve Jobs as being really tough and not nice, mm. right? Like one of these people that could actually be difficult to deal mm. with. Elon yeah. Musk, another great example, right? A living mm. example that we all hear about all the time. And so I think people build this impression of that style of leadership where mm. being direct needs to be abrasive yeah. and difficult towards other people, but it really doesn't. And so it's finding this like nice is all about me and how mm. I'm perceived, as you so yeah. aptly pointed out. But then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got the Elon Musk example or maybe the Steve Jobs example where they're mm. abrasive and difficult. And the question is finding that middle place where you can be yeah. kind to the other person, give them clear feedback, but do it in a respectful way. Mm. You know, as much as I would find it difficult to imply to, to apply that in my life, but I think even when they are being aggressive, even when they are being uh, straight and honest, I think they are still doing service to the other person. Because if I'm not doing anything worthwhile in this space, I might find something else to do somewhere else. Would I be able to apply that in my life? Probably not, because I'm still bothered about a nice image, which is not serving me. I'm aware of that, and I'm working towards that. But yet, as you mentioned, it's a long journey. Hmm. Yeah, it is. Uh, I will also say part of the reason for finding that middle ground of communicating to someone directly and clearly, hmm. but in a respectful way. Yeah is that not only is it, it may serve your own better, best interest because you want to be nice, right? But it also serves the other person because it's much easier to hear feedback when it's delivered in a constructive and positive way yeah. than yeah. when it's come, feels like an attack. Yeah, yeah. So Rusty, let's, let's look at the 14 years that you have invested at Apple. What is it to work at Apple? I mean, one of the most... Uh, influential companies in the world, which is always at the forefront of technological advancements, breakthroughs, challenging the status quo. What is it to work at the Apple? <laughs> well, what, two things stand out for me when you say that. Number one is uh, the people at Apple are very committed to the company as a whole, mm. which makes it an exciting place to work because everybody is, if you imagine everyone's in a boat, they're all rowing in the same direction. It's many of us have worked at companies where there's politics and disagreements between different departments and so on. And it's not that that doesn't happen. Of course, that happens to some degree, but 
by and large, the driving factor at Apple is that people like the company, they like the products, they're excited about what's going on at the company. And so that contributes a lot of passion and energy as a congregation of employees, right? Mm. The employee base mm. contributes a lot of that passion and energy, which makes it a really great place to work. And mm. the other piece that I wanted to mention is just the quality of the people. Mm. Apple attracts some amazing people, some of the smartest people I've ever worked with. Uh, and because they're smart and they're passionate about the company and the work that they're doing, mm. uh, that just makes it really exciting. And to think about a company the size of Apple with tens of thousands mm. of people, yeah. to have that quality of people and passion in the people all working hard towards a common objective, the the growth and the success of the company, that's pretty unique. Yeah. And and that's exactly what my curiosity is. You mentioned that people are really committed. Um you mentioned about people like the company, people like the product, people like what they are doing. What is it about the culture? What is it about the organization that has been able to attract people who are so-called committed? Or mm. once they join the organization, they experience the raise in their commitment level. Well, I... I... I remember when uh, when I started at Apple uh, was was 2005, and yeah. a few years later the iPhone was announced. Wow! So and I was uh, working. 2005 was the era of what iPod? iPod, yes, it was yeah. the era of iPod. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which many people barely even remember, but yes, yeah. it was the era of iPod. Yeah. Uh, and a few years later, the iPhone was announced, and the I was in operations at this point, and one of the things I was just amazed at was that. I would have a conversation with my boss's boss. So two levels mm. above me. And this person was asking me questions about my line of business, the area that I'm responsible for. Mm. And the, based on the questions he was asking, he knew as much about my part of the business as I did. Yeah. And this was shocking to me because, you know, of course he has a much broader scope because mm. I'm just one part of what he's responsible for. Two levels above me, he's got much more, more responsibility. Mm. And yet... He knows a lot about what I'm doing. And to me, as a new employee, that was a big motivator. I was like, oh, this isn't the kind of company where, you know, you do your thing and nobody's really looking to see how mm. are you doing. Yeah. This is the kind of company where people care about the performance of the company. They have mm. an interest in what's going on mm. and they can ask intelligent questions and mm. challenge me. And that was exciting to me. Now, some people come into that environment. So, so your, your question about like, how does, how do you build a culture? Well, this was a part of it. This was a culture where the whole management chain was actively engaged in the business. Yeah. And some people would come into that culture and say, oh, this is too much for me. We experienced that. Some people would come into Apple and they would last a year or two, and then they mm -hmm. would leave. But a lot of people would come and stay a, many, many years like I did. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of a love it or leave it kind of environment. Some people yeah. say, you know, this isn't for me, but the, for the ones who do, it's those people who believe in the yeah. style of working and the company. Yeah. You know, I'm just loving this conversation because you use the word that people would ask intelligent questions. They would challenge you. And you did not say that people would intrude into your scope of working. You did not use the word that people would interfere in my area of work, right? And I think that is what would have made the difference, right? You could use that word that people would interfere and you did not do that. So I'm not well, surprised that you stayed there for 14 years. Yeah. And I think that the people who are successful at Apple are not territorial in that way. Yeah. Uh, Apple, obviously it has an organization structure, but there's not a huge emphasis on title and position, nor is there a mm. huge emphasis on functional function. And so it's really about the interaction of people across levels and across teams to get things done. Mm. Uh, and that's the antithesis. It's the opposite of territorial. Stay out of my business. Don't tell me what to do. Don't intrude. Mm. Uh, and so it really is that kind of teamwork and the ability to say, I'm going to work with the people I need to work with to get yeah. the job done. Yeah. You know, uh, Rusty, talking about all these things is one thing. Putting it into action mm. in the DNF of an organization, it's totally different. Let me throw some more light on why am I asking what I'm asking. In the organization that I've had the privilege of 
working as a leadership consultant, as a team member, as an employee, or as an executive coach. People have so many fears that they've been dealing with that a simple question, a simple intelligent question, a simple challenge is perceived as a threat to their identity, to their territory. How did Apple manage to create that psychological safety where people welcome a question, a challenge from somebody else who might not belong to their territory? I'm not a big fan of the word psychological safety, but we can have, yeah. we can have a separate conversation yeah, that's about okay. that. Uh, but I think the general approach of most employees that I worked with mm -hmm. was a desire to learn and grow. Yeah. And if you start with the desire to learn and grow, then you're going to welcome questions and challenges and opportunities to learn and get a different perspective. Of course, some element of that might feel like a threat, um, mm -hmm. right? Or a criticism, like, what are you telling me I'm doing this wrong? And of course, some people respond that way. But this is the, again, when there's a underlying uh, foundation that everyone is here to do the best thing for the business. Yeah. And then on top of that is a desire of the people who are there to learn and grow and advance and get better. Mm -hmm. Those two things, we're all, we're all trying to achieve the same goal. And Beautiful. if there's a way that I can help you do that by giving you feedback back to this idea of being nice or, versus, or kind, then I'm going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So the basic ground reality that we all begin from is that we all are here to do good for the organization and any feedback, any direct question, any challenge is coming so that we can improve the processes, the culture, uh, the ways of working so that we all can learn and grow. Mm. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. Rusty, you have worked with Tim Cook for on weekly meetings as well. How was yeah. it to work with Tim? That's the first question. And I'm very curious you know, I'm just trying to imagine a situation where Tim was to get into the shoes of someone who is considered to be a demigod, the fan following, the fandom that Steve Jobs had would have been very difficult. What do you think? How did Tim manage to get into the shoes? without losing his calm composure. But what I heard him say at the time was Steve had told him very explicitly, your goal, your job is not to be me. Hmm. Your job is to be you. And hmm. you are in the position you're in because of who you are. Hmm. And so be yourself. Don't try to imitate me. Don't try to think about what I would do and repeat it, but be yourself and follow your guidance as a leader, your heart, your gut, your instinct. Follow as, your as gut. Okay. Yeah. For, follow your guidance. Exactly. And that's, uh, I, I really believe that that's what Tim did. I don't think, you know, Steve was a unique being. I don't yeah. think that anybody could have stepped into those shoes and yeah. become what Steve was and doesn't seem like Tim tried to. And I yeah. think that was his path to success. Yeah. Yeah. Because then Every interaction that you'll find on television or the speeches that he delivers, he's so comfortable in his skin, so comfortable, as if he knows exactly what he's talking about, but the clarity of thoughts, the poise that he brings in is so remarkable. Yeah, he certainly comes across that way. And uh, again, this is not something I've discussed with him, but I'm sure he has his moments of doubt and uncertainty. Yeah, we all sure. do. We all do, uh, yeah. And, you know, one of the things that differentiates the truly great leaders is their ability to go through those moments of doubt mm. and uncertainty mm. and successfully get through those and still move forward, still make progress and advance rather mm. than be paralyzed by them or get stuck in them. Yeah. Any particular quality that you witnessed in him that you have admired through and throughout? What I appreciated about, about Tim was during the time that I was uh, in those weekly meetings with him was his willingness to roll up his sleeves and get into the details. Mm. Uh, you know, we would do a, a weekly business review with him. Uh, again, I was in the operations group, and so it was really operations oriented, supply chain oriented, but we would have a weekly review 
And he would get right into the details with everybody else and, and be a part of the important decisions that were being made. I mean, mm -hmm. For example, when I started at Apple, we talked about it being the iPod days. And uh, back in those days around Christmas time, which is in the US when most of the gift giving happened and therefore when most of the demand was, there was often a shortage of iPods. You couldn't get the color you wanted or the size you wanted or whatever because there weren't enough of them there. Yeah. That decision about how many iPods are we going to build was part of what was made in those meetings, right? We had to make a decision. This is what we're going to commit to building because if you build them and then you don't sell them, that's a big problem. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, Tim obviously was a part of those decisions, but he was willing to roll up his sleeves and get in the details. Mm -hmm. and, and there was one time, uh, this was years and years ago, uh, when there was a battery issue with one of the Mac computers. Yeah. And you could send in your battery and get it replaced. Uh, and Tim participated in the battery recall. You know, he went on and he signed up and on the website and he said, they sent him a box and he sent the battery back. And, and then he gave feedback on the process. You know, I mm -hmm. mean, that, this is pretty detailed, right? This is the, yeah. the COO at the time rolling up his sleeves and saying, what is the customer experience who has to get their battery exchanged? And mm -hmm. he wanted to know what that was. And so yeah. he participated. Yeah. So that to me is just a little example of the, the level of detail that he would get into. Yeah, and the kind of example that you're sharing, you would not even expect um, a senior director in the organization doing that. Um, leave the CEO of the organization of the stature of Tim Cook. Uh, Rusty, I'm curious. There is an image, there's an aura that Apple has when you look at Apple through the eyes of people who don't work at Apple. What is something that people might not know about Apple? or they would not even expect from an organization like Apple. So it's like looking at the organization from inside. Yeah, I think this has changed over the years. But the thing that I was thinking about was, uh, especially when I joined Apple, it mm. was a growing company and mm. it did not run as smoothly as you might expect. Mm. More things were done manually than you would expect. You would expect it to be all automated and yeah. smooth and polished and have great processes and great systems. And that was not the case because Apple was growing rapidly, investing in products mm. for customers and the, the internal operations, the process, the systems and so on were not keeping up. And so there was a time when it was very... Uh, it was very manual and there was a lot of work that was going on inside the company to maintain this kind of growth. And that might be a surprise because the products from a user standpoint work so well. And then you go inside the company and you say, oh, wow, we're still doing all this in spreadsheets and email. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was a bit of a surprise. I think that's yeah. continued to evolve and get better over the years, yeah. but uh, we definitely went through that period. Yeah. Yeah. And that, of course, you would not expect from an organization like Apple. You know, Rusty, my limited experience of interacting with anyone from Apple, uh, I've got a couple of friends who work at Apple currently in the Silicon Valley. There are a couple of people who are in India and associated with Apple. All the videos that I've watched, be it mm -hmm. Steve Jobs or Tim Cooks or my interactions with you, I think the ability in people to influence others, be it from the stage or in one-on-one -on -one conversation, stands apart. What about the culture that teaches an individual to influence others? And they are so smooth in what they are talking about. Tell me about that. Steve Jobs was a master at influence. Hmm. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, the Walter Isaacson uh, biography of Steve yeah. Jobs talks about this, um, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to remember the exact words, but it was this zone when you were around Steve Jobs that you, you believed in the world the way he saw it, mm. and which was sometimes separated from your reality of things. Mm. And that's what Steve Jobs was a master at, is getting mm. people to see the world the way he saw the world. And when he stood up on stage, he that's what he did. He would introduce a new product to people, but he would be talking about it from the his belief, from his mm. deep-seated belief. And that, I believe, has been a core to influence that Steve Jobs used and really permeates the, the entire company. Mm. It's this sense of not 
what are all the problems? What are all the challenges? We're here. How are we going to get to our goals? Hmm. It wasn't any of that. Uh, Steve Jobs came from the belief that the goal is possible. And mm. he's there and he said, I see this reality. And he's mm. standing in that place of reality. Mm. And when you've experienced something, even if it was just vividly imagined, he had a passion for this is possible. And mm. this is what we can do. Wow. And that passion and that belief came through in every way he communicated, verbally, non-verbally, energetically. You mm. could see it when you watched him on stage and from mm. the people who interacted with him directly, yeah. that's what they reported, right? This zone of, of reality shift where mm. they all of a sudden were in his sphere and saw things the way he did. Yeah. Or he would want you to see things. Yes. Yes. You know, Rusty, as you're talking about the self-belief part that he had, and he would want you to see the world the way he sees it. You know, you have written a book, you are an author of a book called Breaking the Code, where you have spoken about our self-image has a direct impact on the way we show up in the world and the way we do what we do in this life. And you have, of course, spoken about uh, learning and growing on several occasions. Tell me, what is this code that you have been talking about, breaking the code? Well, let's go back to being nice, right? And mm. these things that we learn as a child, whether it's mm. to be nice uh, or other things I learned, which was doesn't matter what's in your way, just pick up and keep going. Mm. These become your code, almost as if you've been programmed. And that can serve you well in many respects, uh, and it can limit you in some respects. So this idea of being nice at some point became a limitation for me because it meant that I was not as effective at giving other people feedback, being clear with them and direct. Mm. So break it, that's an example, but breaking the code is about stepping out of these old patterns or programmings, programming from your childhood or from other places in life, from society about mm. how you should be, what is appropriate, what is possible. And Steve Jobs was a master at this, right? Mm. So take, take the iPhone as an example, right? Up until that point, everything looked like a BlackBerry with a keyboard and maybe with a yeah. stylus. And Steve Jobs broke the code. He said, mm. we're going to step totally outside of that paradigm of what everybody else says is the right way to do things and mm. technically feasible. And we're going to bring to life new technology, new ways of interacting, a mm. whole new interface, right? To like a blank screen that you just tap on with your finger. Mm. And uh, revolutionize a whole new product. Yeah, that is an, an example of breaking the code. But you can do that in your own experience too. So for me, leaving Apple, or mm. we talked about, I worked at General Electric under Jack Welch. Yeah. I worked at Apple with Steve Jobs, and then I left to go start my own business. That yeah. to me was breaking the code. That was a mm. total change in approach and direction. I didn't even consider it as a possibility before. Yeah. So, so what th was that examples. moment? What was that moment when you thought? Enough is enough, 14 years done with one of the most remarkable organizations in the world. And I would like to break the code. What was that moment for you? Yeah, the, the moment for me was thinking differently about my career. I was listening to a speaker and it was literally a 20 minute talk. Uh, and it was, it was, I was sitting there and this person asked us to say, to imagine, what would you like to be doing three years from now? Mm. What would your life look like three years from now? If you are at a whole different level of fulfillment, satisfaction, mm. uh, and passion around your life, right? Mm. I was pretty happy with my life. I had a very good life working at Apple, great job, stable, and so on. But she said, you know, breakthrough to just almost impractical level of satisfaction. What mm. would that look like? Yeah. And don't worry about how much money you make or what other people will think or what you've done in the past or do you have the right education? Don't worry about any of those constraints that we normally put on ourselves mm. and just think expansively about what you would love to be doing. Yeah, And that's in that moment is when I had this idea that to say, hey, some of these things that I've learned through my career at Apple, some of these things that I'd at this point started to study, this desire to learn rather, and rather than to be comfortable and just find a comfortable place, the desire mm. to learn and grow trying to bring some of these principles together and share them with other people. Uh, and that mm. was the spark of inspiration that ultimately led towards becoming a coach. Wow. Wow. And today you work with few of the finest, few of the smartest CEOs, C-suite executives in the Silicon Valley. What a beautiful transition. How was the transition for you? 
Yeah, I was funny, you know, 14 years at Apple, I expected that I would be missing it and thinking about it and so on. And I was a week after having left Apple, yeah. it was in the rear view mirror. Uh, and that's not to be critical or judgmental because I loved my mm -hmm. time there. Mm -hmm. But I was looking ahead and I was looking ahead at what was coming. And so the transition, of course, it had its challenges and, and continues to have its challenges. But that's, you know, life always will. Uh, yeah. So I, to me, it's an opportunity to be looking forward and building something that I'm excited about. Yeah. You know, the difficulty of transition is uh, one is, of course, you have to go through a lot of uh, turmoil, the emotional turmoil and the tsunami of emotion that you experience. That's, of course, one difficulty. Another difficulty is I think we don't ask the question that you asked. That you, when you said that, uh, what would you be doing three years from now that you'll be super excited about? What kind of opportunities would you like to create? And I think that becomes a challenge for most of us. What's your take on this? Absolutely. I think most people think about what's going on the today, this week, this coming weekend. Mm -hmm. We tend to think short term rather than big term. And we tend mm -hmm. to think constrained rather than unconstrained. Yeah. Right. Um, well, you know, I want to go on vacation. Well, how much time do I have? How much money do I have? What's reasonable mm -hmm. to do? Yeah. As opposed to where would I love to go to vacation and then start figuring out how can you take steps to set you up to achieve that? I'll just say like in my experience, leaving Apple to go become a coach. It's not that I got the idea and the next day I went in and quit my job. That's no. not what happened. Of course not. Mm -hmm. Right. I got the idea. And then over the next year, I explored it. I went and I got trained and certified and I mm -hmm. started a business and so on so that a year later, by the time I finally did go in and tell my boss that I was going to be leaving, it was the logical next step. It mm -hmm. didn't feel like this giant leap. And I think yeah. that's this question of, you know, think about where you want to be three years from now, five years from now. Uh, and by the way, I think three to five years is far enough out. Don't go 10 or 20 because nobody knows what we want to be doing 20 years from now. So true. Yeah. And then start taking the little steps that move you there. Yeah. You know, Rusty, in your, the coaching philosophy that you have, you often speak about that what is very important for a leader should be in an organization. A leader. A leader. Yeah. I've been formulating uh, what I call the fundamentals of leadership. There are five elements to that. And it's, it's you know, we often think about leadership as inspiring other people, um, you know, communicating well. Some of, some of these uh, uh, skills that are about how a leader interacts with other people. Hmm. But before that, there's how is the leader showing up as a person? How are they interacting with themselves? Hmm. Hmm. And these, that's what these five fundamentals of leadership are about. It. And it's about number one is self-awareness. So being tuned into what's going on with you uh, and being aware of yourself, your strengths, your weaknesses, and your emotional and energetic state. Number two is your vision and your values. Where mm -hmm. are you going, right? That's that three years, five years vision. And that's for you and for your business. Number three is courage because it requires courage to actually step forward and take action. Number four is resilience because the action doesn't always result in what you want. Sometimes there are obstacles and challenges and it takes resilience to get through those. And number five is compassion. And compassion is about... Uh, being kind to yourself and being kind mm. to others. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So self-awareness, vision and values, courage, courage to take action. You spoke about resilience and compassion. Yes. Yes. You know, having worked with leaders from different organizations, um, Rusty, you have worked with startups, you have worked with established MNCs as well. Mm. What's the primary difference that you've been able to identify in leaders of these two organizations, and you look at them through these five pillars and components? That's a great question. Leaders in a large company tend to be ex a little bit more externally oriented. Okay. Uh, which is looking for what's expected of them and delivering against that. And it's actually one of the challenges that leaders in large organizations often face because it's, it's that transition from being externally oriented, I'm doing what I'm being told to do, to being internally oriented, which is what do I see as the opportunities and what am I going to advocate and drive as a leader? Mm. It's that transition that is difficult for people in a large company. Mm. In a startup, the leader of a startup is less likely to face that because they are 
beginning something from scratch mm-hmm. and they're creating something and bringing it to the world. And I think the challenge in a startup for, for a, a CEO or a leader of a startup organization is the transition from creation to uh, mm-hmm. execution or running of a business. Mm. Right. It's very different to create a product and get it off the ground than it is to build an organization that works well and can deliver that product or that service at scale. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you often talk about scale. If you have our common friends, Rusty, they call you secretly, they call you the scaling coach. And you often talk about operations, you talk about leadership, you talk about impact. Tell me about that. Why did you choose operations, leadership, and impact in your coaching uh, genre? I, well, part of it is personal interest. I've always enjoyed operations and always want things to work well and smoothly and efficiently. Mm. Uh, and so I, I've been, I've just had a personal interest in that my whole life. And that's one of the, the things that I enjoyed is how do I bring more operational expertise to the company mm. where things were happening manually? Leadership is, to me, it's it's everything. Most people often think about leadership as how I interact with another person. To me, it always starts with how I'm interacting with myself. With myself. You can't lead anyone else unless you can lead yourself. Mm. And so to me, I just, I'm a big believer in learning more and more about myself and how I can be more effective and helping other people to do that. Because mm. uh, that fundamentally is the only thing that's in the way of achieving this grand vision that you can imagine for yourself three or five years from now is is your your willingness to step forward and lead yourself and go take action towards it. And that's all about impact they can have on the world. Uh, that's a good thing. Uh, and yeah. so for me, it's, you know, helping great leaders achieve great things in this world is uh, is, is really a, a, where my passion is. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that. You know, you made a very profound statement, Rusty, that you cannot lead anyone else without leading yourself. How easy or difficult is it for you to communicate in its true essence to leaders who are number driven, who are uh, performance driven, for whom only the matrix, the needle movement matters? Well, the truth is some of those people are open to a conversation of leadership and some are not. But for those people who are open to it, there is ample research that suggests and and proves the point that a high performing organization where there's teamwork and respect and leadership and interaction among the people and trust that those organizations outperform other organizations. Yeah. Yeah. The data is there. The interesting part is when leaders try to shift their game from only number driven and being caring to other people as well, being kind to other people as well. There is a dip that people experience. And that is the moment where they have to see what's happening to them because right now they are transitioning into a different way of being. And in that transition, a coach plays a very vital role. A coach plays a very vital role. How do you as a coach hold the space where a leader can go through the transition, can go through that turmoil of emotions and yet stay true to who he wants to become, who she wants to become. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's the uh, the real privilege of a coach mm. is to be with someone through that journey. Uh, and just like we were talking about Steve Jobs, having this ability to see the future and yeah. help other people see the future. Uh, mm. I view that as one of my roles as a coach. Uh, and it's not the future that I define it's the future that my client defines. What is it mm. that they see as the future for them and their company? And my, part of my role as a coach is to hold that future for them mm. through the mm. turmoil, through the challenges and so on, but to just be clear and keep coming back to this is where we're going. And absolutely yeah. it's possible. Uh, I, and I, I also want to say one thing, Gaurav, which you, you referenced this dip, right? If, if someone is purely performance driven and then they start to explore the possibility of bringing more authenticity or connection or humanity or kindness into their leadership, empathy, there there, there may be a dip. And I think behind that statement is this belief or assumption that having empathy or being kind or focusing on people means being soft. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case. I think it's important to point out, just as we were saying earlier, being kind 
can be the catalyst for delivering yeah. tough, clear, direct feedback. Yeah. And yeah. having empathy and compassion for others also can be a tool that can be used to deliver clear a clear feedback and hold high standards and high expectations. I think it's so important to say just because you have compassion and you have you're kind towards other people doesn't mean you have lower standards. Yeah, thank you. And you know that gives birth to another question. Um, Alasti, on one hand when I'm saying that being kind one of the assumptions could be being weak. Mm. Let's look at the contrast to that. When people are very direct to an extent of being ruthless or controlling or protecting or commanding or authoritative or a little bit on the edge of arrogance, what do you think? What are they driven by? I, I, well, I, I think there's a lot of, way, lot of ways to answer that and there's a lot of possibilities, but one, yeah. certainly one possibility is uh, insecurity, right? A lot of the classic literature and mm. and theory suggests that the bullies, the people who are the meanest and the most aggressive, yeah. are also the most insecure. Yeah, uh, and I think that carries on through uh, through adulthood as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. You know, whether we are trying to be nice to people or we are controlling, the roots are somewhere in the childhood. <laughs> the lesson yeah. that we have learned initially. And I think it's extremely important that we need to be in our journey with the self-awareness part that you spoke about, uh, Rusty. And I so much echo with you when you said self-awareness, vision and values and courage and resilience and compassion. Unless I could be compassionate and kind to my own self and I'll start to operate my life from a space of self-awareness, I think it doesn't really matter what I create, what I accomplish. I have not Absolutely. Met, met myself. Absolutely. And, and, and that, that's a lot of mean, personal meaning comes from that. That's where you can yeah. tap into passion. And, and again, compassion is towards yourself and towards others. I was thinking about uh, one of my clients recently who was uh, deciding to uh, let someone on his team go leave, and leave the company. Yeah. And there's certainly a, a perspective that says the compa- that is the compassionate thing to do. Yeah. Right. One one perspective of compassion, maybe the most common compression understanding of compassion or kindness would be, well, just lower the standards, just let them do what they're going to do and make it easy no. on them. But the a much healthier version of that is to say, look, it's not kind to this other person for them to be in a situation that's not the right fit for them. It's not kind yeah. for them. It's not kind for us. It's not good for anybody in this situation. The best thing I can do mm. is to help them get out of this situation. Yeah. That is the kindest, most compassionate thing to do. And so I just wanted to offer that as a specific example. It's something I've yeah. been talking through with a client recently because it's it puts into clarity, it gives a specific example to what does it look like to be compassionate or kind and still have mm-hmm. high standards. And yeah. back to your point, like that is ultimately what makes for a rich life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Rusty, I'm not even expecting an answer. If you were to make a part of your life even richer by being kinder and being more compassionate to yourself, which area would you begin with? Just a well, question. Well, I'll tell you, the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the piece that I'm working on right now is, uh, I, I mentioned that I grew up in a family that was just pick up and go, get it done. Don't Don't worry about the situation, your feelings, whatever, just go get it done. And I have that has translated for me into my life where it's the, my foot is always on the gas pedal, just go, yeah. go, go. And so for me, what I'm experimenting with and, and learning is this process of how can I let off the gas pedal? Not that I want to stop. I don't want to yeah. stop moving. I want yeah. to continue to move and grow and I so on, what you're saying. but not with this relentless drive that I have to get it done. Yeah. Yeah. So rather than operating from a space of any kind of insecurity, how can I operate from a space of self-awareness and compassion? Thank you so much, Rusty. It was an absolute pleasure having you on this podcast. Such a pleasure. What a great conversation, Gaurav. Thank you so much. Um, Love the questions. I love the, the variety of exploration. Thank you so much.